Amen. Some good worship, wasn't it? Some good worship, as always. Thank you, Brad and crew, and everybody else. Well, we're spending a little bit of time talking about relationships. Last week, we talked about our personal agendas and how our personal agendas get in the way, how our heart idols become an issue for us that cause everything from conflict to poor speech and the like. So we're going to continue to talk about conflict today, and then we'll be moving into talk, our speech, next week. And then we'll be looking at some others after that, forgiveness and some other ones for a few weeks. If you haven't seen, we are putting out books to recommend for you to look at, to buy. Uh, Amber's got them out here on a table. There's only three having to do with this series, but one's War of Words about our speech. One is Resolving Everyday Conflict by Ken Sandy, and one is... Uh, another one, which escapes my mind, I think it's on forgiveness, but, uh, oh, it's Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Life Together, which is a classic about how we love each other and how we're community and how we're family of God. So if you're interested in any of those, just let us know. Amber can help you order those, or you can order them offline, but they'll go along with what we're talking about, okay? So you can take a look at those on the way out. Today we're talking about the second part of conflict, which is God's agenda for us. Our personal agendas are driven by our heart idols, our personal interests. But as we look at Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, primarily 25 through 32, but we'll look at the first couple verses in Ephesians chapter 4 also. As we look at that, we're going to be looking at God's agenda for us. God's agenda for us, okay? So Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 reads, As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Verse 2 of Ephesians chapter 4, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to what? One hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Verse 6, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Verse 7, but to each one of us, grace has been given as God apportioned it. And then as we move down to verse 25, of Ephesians 4, it says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Verse 26, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And 27, and do not give the devil a, fro- a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Verse 29, but only what is helpful for building each other up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. In verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice, and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. As we look at this, it made me think about, this whole chapter is about how we walk with God. Now we move from our agenda, which is driven by our own hearts and our own self-interest and the idols that drive those, and I'll remind you of some of those. We talked about those at length last week, but we'll talk a little bit about them this morning. But we move from our agenda into God's agenda. And our agenda causes a lot of conflict between us and other people. Intimate relationship, friendships, coworkers, peer relationships, people in the community and the like. And what God's talking about, he's talking about us moving from one way of walking in our own flesh, into a new way of walking in the Holy Spirit. That's what chapter 4 of Ephesians is about. And so it's moving from our agenda, our personal agenda, onto God's agenda. It's a different way of walking. When I was thinking about how we walk and what that matters, I thought about a lot of different things, but the one that came to my mind that was the greatest analogy of this is this. If you've ever gone to Washington, D.C., and you visit the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, have you ever seen the changing of the guard there? If you don't know the 3rd Infantry Regiment of the United States Army, its sole task, its only purpose for existing, is to guard Washington, D.C., and in particular, Arlington, and even more focus, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And so out of that entire big regiment, which is armed, fully armed, fully capable of defending the city, out of that regiment, there's a small group of men that are the best of the best of the best. And they're chosen to honor 
the three dead soldiers that are unknown at the tomb of the unknown soldier. And so every day they come out and for an hour they walk a very specific way. And if you watch them, they walk a very specific way. 21 steps. They turn. So many steps. Turn. 21 steps back. Turn. And they do it over and over and over. And then when they change the guard on the hour, they do it in a very ritualistic, ceremonially honoring way. They are graded on that walk. So they practice it for months as a new guy coming into that group. And the men who are already doing it and the commander that's in charge of it will count, will videotape, will watch them do it live when there's not people there, and they will practice. They have a whole thing just like what's above that you see that's buried below the exact same thing, and they practice and practice and practice and practice. And if it snows six feet... They will be out there, the same walk, the same path, the same number of steps, the same everything. In Hurricane Irene, just a few years ago, I looked it up. There's video of these guys doing the walk in hurricane winds and rain in full uniform with rain gear doing the walk. What it means is that if you belong to that honor guard... Your sole purpose for existence as a soldier is to honor all the unknown soldiers that have honored us with their sacrifice. And then I looked up other video. What if one of us in the crowd laughs or shouts out or something? There's tons of videos online that you can pull up on YouTube of those men stopping and literally verbally assaulting the crowd and demanding respect and even physically engaging if they need to be. Because at the end of the day, their sole purpose for existence is to honor those unknown soldiers that have given their life for you and I. 100% total focus in their walk on whose agenda? Their own? No, somebody else's agenda. And that pours into our text here today because we're trying to move from our agenda onto God's agenda, right? Just like those people. Just like those soldiers, we want to walk in a way that matters to God and his agenda. Last week, we spoke about conflict and relationships and our love of our desires out of James chapter 4. What causes quarrels and fights among you? Is it not the desires that spring up within you that cause these things? You want, you desire, you cannot have, so you kill, you steal, you destroy because you want to have these things. You even pray for your desires and God doesn't answer them because of the selfishness of your heart. And so we looked at those things. And so some of those kind of idols are these. I'll put them in a new form than I shared with you last week. Number one, comfort. I want, I deserve, or I must have comfort. And I fear, there's always a corollary fear, I fear hard work and discomfort. Okay? Number two, pleasure. I want, I deserve, I must have pleasure. And the corollary is I fear pain. Okay? And that's our culture. We're in love of pleasure. Recognition, I want, deserve, or must have the approval of others, or I'll be devastated, and I fear being overlooked or dismissed. Recognition. Power and control. I want, deserve, or must have power and control over my environment and over other people. You ever heard, you ever worked with somebody like that? I know you have. Probably have somebody in your family. And others or I who will be able to survive, right? I fear being told what to think or do, and I fear unpredictability. Power and control. And the final heart idol is acceptance. I want, deserve, and must have others' acceptance. And you are responsible to give it to me. I fear rejection and disappointing other people. And so these these heart idols that we have in our flesh, in our sin, they drive us, James chapter 4 said last week, they drive us to seek out our own self-interest. And they're our agenda, and we don't know about them. They're closet, right? They, they spoil our relationship. They, they kind of live underneath the surface, and they kind of bubble up at the last minute when you don't know they're going to happen, right? Here you are interacting with your spouse, and everything's great, and all of a sudden, out comes Mr. Ugly, right? You wives have never seen that, right? You've never seen that. All of a sudden, out comes Mr. Ugly, because these heart idols that we hold on to and don't think about, they're driving that behavior, right? My desires drive my interactions, consciously or unconsciously, and my relationships are are pitting my interests against the interests of other people and against the interests of God. And that's what we looked at last week. 
That's my personal agenda. And worse yet, the more satisfying the relationship, the closer I am, the more intimate to another person, the less conscious I am of those heart idols, those self-interest driving my interactions with them, right? That's the truth you got to think about and you just got to write down. The closer I am to somebody else, the more those heart idols get in the way of the relationship. Because we often think, hey, I'm, I'm very close to my spouse. I'm very close to my kids. I'm very close to my brother or my coworker or whatever else, my family member. That should be the best, most satisfying relationship. And then we are disappointed at the heartache and the pain that comes in that relationship because our heart idols come out the most, right? Because we feel safe with them. We feel like everything's great in that environment. And we feel like the best is going to come out, but that's when, when sin snaps and it rears its ugly head. And out comes Mr. and Mrs. Nasty. Our personal agendas. But Paul is going to tell us to enter into God's agenda in Ephesians chapter 4. He calls us into relationship with him, God does, and simultaneously to engage in relationship with other people within the body of Christ, right? We are his family, so we're going to struggle. When you say, I have difficulties in church, I love hearing this as a pastor. Why do you not go to church? I don't go to church because this church hurt me, or I had this problem with this church or how these people hurt me. And that's legitimate. That's legitimate. But what I want to say to people sometimes is this. Did you not have the same problem in your family growing up? Did your siblings not punk you? Because my older brothers punked me. Even my sister, she kicked my teeth in sometimes, okay? She was tougher than all the boys, okay? Sometimes they loved me and blessed me, and sometimes they punked me and put me down for their own self-interest. That's how a regular family is. The body of Christ is no different. In our flesh, not submitted to the Holy Spirit, we're going to have those things happen in our relationships. So we're going to try to move on to God's agenda, Paul says, right, in chapter 4 of Ephesians. As his family, we're going to struggle with each other, like a husband and wife struggle or a sister or brother, right? But when we're struggling with our husband or wife, we ought to be thinking, and when I'm struggling with my wife, that's my sister in the Lord. I'm struggling with a fellow sister in the Lord. When I struggle with my kids, I'm struggling with a younger brother or sister in the Lord because they know Christ. When I struggle in those relationships, it's normal and natural. It isn't good. It isn't godly, but it's normal and natural. And so if we adopt this mindset that's going to be part of life, that conflict, and look for the hidden agendas, then we can start to do something with it, okay? So Paul's going to tell us some things, some practical things. Last week was the conceptual. This week's more of the practical. First thing Paul's going to tell us is consider the prominence of unity. God cares more about our unity with each other than he does about us being right or wrong, right? Chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you received right? We've received this from the Lord. Be completely humble, gentle, patient, bearing one another in love. Make every effort, verse 3, to keep the what? The unity of the Spirit. The unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And then Paul goes into this diatribe that we're one body, in one spirit, one this, one that, one, 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 one. And Paul's going to point out that God's agenda is different than our agenda. His agenda is that we have unity, harmony, and peace, even in the struggle, because the greater picture for the good of the glory of God is us being one. Now, that's different than what you and I want, right? I'll tell you what, it's different than what I want. I'd like you guys to do it my way, right? I mean, that's the sin in my soul, right? But God's agenda in verses 1 through 7, is that unity is more important than being right or wrong, right? Remember, last week I said our identity and what we worship determines everything for us, right? Who we are, who we belong to, as well as what we put in first place determines what our heart matters most. Where your heart is, where your treasure is, there your heart is, Jesus said. Matthew 6, 21. So, if I make sure that I put myself thinking about my identity and what I worship... Okay, so I want you to write down these two things. Whenever you're struggling in relationships, number one, what is God's design and purpose for the relationship? Number two, why does he allow me to be in this relationship to fulfill that design and purpose, okay? So, first of all, verse one, it says, live a life worthy of the calling you've received. 
It says in verse 7 that his grace has been given to us, right? And that grace is to make us his children of God. It means that we are adopted into the family of God. The whole book of Galatians is about our adoption from being sinners lost forever to hell and away from God to now being part of God's family and being adopted into the family of God. That's what the entire book of Galatians is about. Its underlying theological theme is adoption. And we've now, as we belong to God, we need to live a life worthy, verse 1 says, of the calling that we have received. What is that calling? To be his kids. To be his children. My wife is adopted. She's very open about that, so it's easy to talk about it. Her parents are the parents that raised her, who adopted her, who loved her. Her brother's adopted too. Now, she's biologically from a nurse and a mechanic and this, that, and the other, but that's not her parents. That's not her mom and her dad. She's been adopted into the King Cade family, and so my wife's identity is she is, or was before she was a teal, a King Cade, right? She's a King Cade. And she takes upon the mannerisms of her family. Watch her with her mother, my mother in law. It's like twins, they look nothing alike but they act totally the same because she's been adopted. Her calling has been to be grafted into the Kincaid family. Your and my calling, our identity that defines who we are is we are grafted into the body of Christ and that Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Savior, our Master and our King. He calls the shots, not us. So live a life worthy of the calling that you received. And if we focus upon God's called us into this identity, and he's put us into relationships with each other, this struggle, what's the purpose of the design? To grow in the grace of God. Verse 7, the grace that he's given us. So why am I still in this struggle? We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. Because that struggle is what makes me become more sanctified, more like Christ. God is winding out the edges, right? One of the ladies in our Sunday school, Verna said, uh, somebody in her past used to call it a person with sandpaper, right? That rounds out your edges. So I said to Verna, I said, what about the dude with a chainsaw that cuts you in half, all right? You ever had those kind of personnel you deal with? They're not sandpaper. They're not a skill saw. They're a rip saw that seems to take you right down to the core, But God allows us to be in those struggles. And what's he do? At verse 7 it says, but to each one of us grace has been given as God has apportioned it. He allows us to be in that struggle so that we will encounter him and more cups of his grace to become more like his son. That's not fun, but that's real life. That's what God's purpose in the struggle is all about. Right? 2 Peter 1, verse 3 through 4, his divine power... God's, has given us everything that we need for a godly life. He has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them we may participate in his divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by what? Our evil desires. Our evil desires. Right? God's given us his divine power. He's given us the empowerment. We talked about that in Sunday school. The Holy Spirit within us gives us divine empowerment to stand in the struggle of those relationships and still to work them out and to be more like Christ. And as we do that, we give God's grace. The Holy Spirit through us gives God's grace to the other person. And if they're godly, vice versa. Hopefully the rip saw will become a little bit more like fine sandpaper and really shape us up good, right? And verse 3, what does it say? Make every effort to keep the unit, right? It says that we are to work. We're supposed to do something. We're supposed to put out effort. I hear from people all the time, Why doesn't God just heal this relationship? Magic, hocus pocus. Ty is very good at that. He's phenomenal at that. Jesus doesn't do that. He makes us work out our salvation in the struggle. Make every effort. God's agenda is peace, harmony, mutuality, unity, togetherness. My self-interest gets crucified at the cross for Christ's interest. Did you hear that? I give up my self-interest. It gets crucified at the foot of the cross for God's interest, which is other people. And that's what it means to be a disciple of Christ, right? 1 Peter 1.5 says, 
says the same thing. In that, we're talking about those, he says, make every effort, right after he talks about the divine nature. Isn't it interesting that Paul and Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, say the exact same thing in two completely different books, having never talked about that? Paul says, make every effort. Peter says, make every effort. Very interesting in that 2 Peter 1.5. The same words are used in the Greek. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling is how it's put in Philippians. Right? God gives us the spiritual tools to get the job done if we'll focus on our own sinful souls. So we need to get busy. We need to get busy. We need to help ourselves before we help somebody else. How many of you have ridden in a commercial airplane? Yeah, all right. It's nice. Commercial airplane. God's gift to kill my soul. Okay, I hate flying. It makes me crazy, all right? I love the takeoff, which most people hate. I love the landing. You know why I love the landing? I don't care how bad the landing is. You know what it means? I am on the ground. (laughs) Praise God. I'm on the ground where man was supposed to be. If we were supposed to fly, I'd be Superman, okay? But when you fly, you got all these natural things, and I psych myself up. We're flying. All everything's good. But I love the beginning of the flight. These beautiful, wonderful, good-looking stewards and stewardesses, they come out, and they tell you everything that can kill you. And they say, if we crash land in the water, Mr. Teal, can you pop off that door? Do you think you're big enough, strong enough? Girl, I'm going to kick that door out. (laughs) We're out of this plane, okay? I've told them that a few times. And then I put my son next to me. Do you think we can handle this? I think so. Okay? (laughs) Then they say, well, but this is the interesting part. They say, if somehow something happens to rupture the hole, the hole will depressurize. The plane will depressurize. And then they'll drop these wonderful, cute little things that are braze orange or, or yellow that are called oxygen masks, right? So you can breathe. All right, this is getting a little bit better. But what I think is interesting in that, they say, if you're with a child, which we were when we were going to Orlando a few weeks ago, if you're with a child, put the mask on your child first, right? No. They say what it sounds like, throw your kid under the bus. Put the, put the mask on yourself, then you help your kid. So I asked the stewardess after one of these flights, I said, what's the deal with that? You know, it sounds weird. I don't know what you're thinking, but as a parent, it sounds weird. She said, it's very simple, Mr. Teal. In depressurized situations of extreme stress, you will go without oxygen very rapidly. And if you pass out... You cannot help your daughter or your son put their mask on. If they pass out while you're putting yours on, you can put oxygen on them, and they will revive on their own. But if you go down, they're definitely going down. Well, now this makes a lot of sense to me. i got to put on my own mask first. Jesus is saying the same thing. Make every effort to work on your own heart idols first. Get after them. Work hard. Cooperate with the Holy Spirit through the scriptures, through prayer, through the body of Christ to work on your heart idols. And as you get healthier, then you can help the next guy next to you. It's all about reducing conflict by reducing self. So I'm going to ask you, are we so enculturated to look after me that we forget to look to the Holy Spirit to empower us to do the work in our relationships? Is your first natural inclination that when the conflict comes up, how come that other person is not blah, 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 blah? If you're hearing that, probably a heart idol's kicked in, and you're not even thinking about it. But if your first inclination is, this really stinks, but how can I bless that other person and help them? And what is their agenda that they need that I can help fulfill? If you're talking like that inside, then probably the Holy Spirit's taken over. And you're where you should be, right? We need to be thinking about the other person. Look after their interests before your own interests, right? What other things? What role does the memorization and meditation on Scripture do for you? If, if the Word of God divides soul and spirit, dividing down into the intents and thoughts and judgments of the heart, if that's what it does according to Ephesians 4.12, then we have to get it inside. We have to spend time thinking about it reading it, meditating, ruminating, going over it, working it into the seeps, right? If you build a cabin and you ever do chinking, you know what chinking is, where you fill in between the the things on a cabin, the different log poles? It's hard work. But you got to work to squeeze and to press 
that chinking into all these weird little cracks and holes and little divots that you can't see. You just keep pressing hard and filling it in, pressing it in with the trowel and keep smash it in, trusting that it's being creeped into those cracks because you keep applying pressure. When we get into the Word of God, God's Holy Spirit pushes it into the seep and the cracks of our soul. He does the same thing. But we got to do the hard work of memorizing and meditating on it. What about prayer? What role does it have? As one of God's tools to shape us off of our agenda onto God's agenda, looking after others and God first instead of ourselves. When we pray, do you not think it's the heart of God to move you off of your idols onto somebody else's needs? It's biblical. It's the heart of God. It's a prayer that he wants you to pray so that he can answer that. Is it instantaneous? No. You have to struggle in the relationship with God for it to happen. But it will come. Verse 4, there's only one body, one spirit. Just as you were called into God's family to one hope, your salvation. And you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. The goal of God is for us to be unified in our relationships, even in the struggle. Do we have that kind of unity with one another? Is it more important for us to obey God and to please Him and to seek the unity and the best of somebody else than it is for us to get what we want? That's the shift from our agenda to God's agenda. Point two, okay? The second thing you're going to see in the text, in verse two, is we are to adopt four main attitudes of Jesus, right? It says, be completely humble and gentle, patient and bearing with one another in love. That's the four attitudes. This is something we're to make every effort towards to actively do. Humility, right? Therefore, as a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to walk worthy of the calling that you've received with all humility, Paul says. I challenge you to think about Jesus without thinking about humility. Just think about it for a second. Jesus' entire character, when you read the four Gospels, is framed in humility. He even described himself with two characteristics. One of them was meekness, humility. He describes himself that way as God Almighty, right? It's a hallmark of his life. And in God's plan, God the Father kept him humble. He was born in a cow pen. He lived a poor life. He's never served in public office. Did he ever write a book? Did he ever write a seminar? Did he ever preach a seminar of how to make your life better? Never. And he exercised extreme restraint in the presence of stark pride of the Pharisees and the religious leaders. He washed the feet of his disciples, John chapter 13, saying that he was a doulos, their slave, their servant. Okay? And he submitted willingly to the humiliating torture and death of the cross. Did he ever spit at Pilate? Did he ever curse those who were killing him? No, instead, one of the seven saints across his father, forgive them, for they don't even know what they're doing. His whole life was about looking after the interest of you and I and every other billions of people that have ever been born and lived. It was all about doing the will of the Father. And he looks at us and he says in Matthew 18, 4, whoever humbles himself like this child, just like a child, this one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus often used children as an example of humility. Why? How many people have children that have power? No, if you're three, you're completely dependent upon your parents. You're dependent upon them for food and for changing you and for getting you to sleep and everything. You're completely dependent upon them for their medical care and everything. And kids get it. And Jesus says you've got to be like a child. You're not self-sufficient. You're not as strong as you think. You're not as great as you think. You need to be humble. A child is never bothered by not being in first place. Yeah, they want your attention. They want to be in first place, but they understand there's other needs. That's part of what Jesus teaches us, right? Johnny Erickson taught us says humility is just another word for the being the little, the least, the last, the lost that position in life, which is amazingly the face of Jesus himself. I like that. I like that. Humility ultimately says, as an attitude that you want to adopt and pray for and ask for, memorize scripture on, is I don't have to have it my way. Things don't necessarily have to please me, 
It's all about everybody else. How about this? The music in this church is not what I prefer, but that's fine if it ministers to other people. The decision of the elders may not be what I would have done, but I trust that God's going to work through them. The decision of my husband is not what I agree with, but for the greater good of the family, I'll go along with that. My boss's decision in regards to this thing is not what I believe is right, and I hate it, but maybe for the greater good of the corporation and the body there, I need to go along with it. That's what humility looks like. It's totally different from what we do. Secondly, gentleness. I, therefore, a prison Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling that you've received with all humility and gentleness. In the New Testament days, this Greek word describes horses that were what? Broken. You ever hang out with a horse for very long? I don't know much about horses, but I know they're like a thousand pounds and very strong. And the first time I got too close to a horse and he came up when I called him and he smacked me in the face, I learned how strong he was just with his nose. He didn't mean it. They're very powerful, though. But a broken horse does the will of its master, even though it still has power. And it still has immense ability and strength. But it's been shaped to be useful for its master. And in gentleness, in our brokenness, we still have power and strength in Christ. But we allow what God's doing in our lives to shape us, to make us who we're supposed to be. We don't insist on our own rights. We're not easily offended. We don't hold grudges. Again, Jesus comes to my mind. Didn't Jesus show a lot of restraint? But was he weak? He was not weak. He was very strong, right? He was strong enough to go to the cross for you and I. He said this, Who is wise and understanding among you? He should show his works by good conduct with wisdom's gentleness, right? Find it hard to believe that Jesus was weak. Is it possible for us to be very strong in our gentleness? Another way that Jesus described himself. Is it possible for us to be very strong and be gentle? Yes. You ever watch a big, strong young man who's a new father with his newborn? Immense strength of a young man and power gently holding this tiny little creature his wife's just made, holding the head, holding the neck, holding the body, cooing, loving, He's still just as strong when he goes to work the next day. But he's gentle among that child. And when we treat each other that way, it is very powerful. Very powerful. Jesus endured the cross. He despised the shame. He endured our hostility from sinners. For what? So that he could purchase us. He was gentle among them, and this must be a mark of us. Three, bearing with one another, right? With all humility, gentleness, with patience, and accepting or bearing with one another in love, right? That's a powerful thing, that we bear with one another. It means that we put up with people. It means that there's messiness in the middle of the relationships, but we say it's okay for the offense of the other. It means literally to make room, to enlarge and make room for that offense that's coming. And to bear each other's burdens. Isn't that what the body of Christ is about? Isn't that what the family is supposed to be about? Isn't that what marriage is supposed to be about? That you're not going through this world alone and you have somebody else that's there to help bear your burdens, to uphold you, to lift you up. And that gentleness, that patience, that humility. Bearing with one another in love. Putting up with people's differences, their quirks, their irritating habits. It means enduring the gaping holes in their own fabric of their holiness. Guess what? Each of us has huge holes in our sanctification. And I pray that you will put up on mine. We balance these things. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another. Yet, Where I'm deficient, God's Spirit wants to transform me to take that place and to become that. How does that happen? Sometimes through our speech, right? Sometimes those things that we do, and we're going to look at that next week, 
But we pray for these things. We work on these things. When we see ourselves or someone else says, I don't see you doing that, you confess it one to the other and you ask for forgiveness and you ask God to transform you and you watch over months and over years how different you are down the road. I've told you before about a young man by the name, an old man by the name of Levi that I worked with that was an ex-coal miner. And in his 80s, he was the most popular man at the church that we served at like this. He was a greeter. You put him out on the greeter because everybody loved Levi. Everybody loved to talk to him. They would come to church not to hear the preacher, but just to see Levi. That's the guy you want greeting him at the door. And Levi, when he told me about his life, he was a horrible sinning coal miner when he was young. He loved to drink, and he had killed a man and spent eight years in prison for it. And when I talked to him about it, I just asked him, is there anything that you ever, I didn't say anything about it. I just said, is there something more you want to share when he was telling me about that? And he said, I'll tell you what I've never told anybody else, including my wife. I said, okay. I was kind of bracing for it. He said, I use my bare hands. And I looked him in the face as I took his life. And as he said that, the tears started flowing down his face and down his chest, literally soaking his shirt. And you could see the pain that he had on his heart for what he had done when he didn't know Christ. But who he was now was this humble, gentle, kind, caring, loving guy. And I said, how many years ago was that? And he said, 50. And I said, what's been the difference? And I love this answer. The difference has been my Lord and my wife. All the difference in the world. God shining through her and working in my life, right? So then Paul's going to move us now. As we move over to chapter 4, verse 25, to some practical outwards, we're going to try to move through these. Okay, first one is, it says, verse 25, you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. The very first outworking of these four attitudes of moving from our agenda to God's agenda of seeking unity between people, the very first thing that manifests these four attitudes is the skill of speaking the truth to one another. How often do we cry and lie to each other? All the time, right? How many of you ever asked a friend, how you doing, knowing that they weren't doing well ahead of time? You say, how you doing, and what do they say? I'm fine. You lying dog. You were not fine. I know what you're struggling with because your wife's already ratted you out to me. Okay, I know what's going on. But we say to each other, I'm fine, because we're not used to asking for grace from each other. It's difficult for us to do in our independence. But telling the truth is the bedrock of trust. Why does Paul say, put away falsehood, and instead speak the truth and love to your neighbor? Because it's the bedrock of trust. Trust flows from truth and honesty and reality in relationships. I tell my kids, the one thing you can't do to me is you can't lie to me. Because if you lie to me, I can't trust you, and then our relationship is eroding. You cannot lie to me. You can tell me you ran the truck through somebody's house at a high speed and got arrested and set the night in jail. That we can deal with. But you can't lie to me. That we can't deal with because we're not dealing with reality. Truth is the bedrock of trust right? Now, when we speak the truth in love, we don't speak with brutalness. We speak with gentility, back to those attitude sets, right? With gentility, we stop. We take a moment to think about what we're going to say. Most importantly, we try to get in the other person's shoes, and we'll talk more about this next week, and we ask ourselves, how are they going to receive that? I must confess I've not done enough of that in my life at times. It's always a skill to grow in, right? How is the other person going to receive this? I was telling the Sunday school class earlier, gentleness, love, compassion, relationship. That's how you speak the truth in love. Pray over your heart. Consciously seek the Lord's help in your heart condition. Be thoughtful. Think it out. And then be careful. And then speak to that other person. Be slow, be gentle, be kind, and make adjustments in the middle of your speaking as you see their response on their body. You ever see somebody doing that? You tell them something, they kind of... 
that you're probably doing it the wrong way. You might need to backtrack a little bit. Softness leads to receptivity. John Gottman's research is one of the leading researchers in marital therapy. Great guy at the University of Seattle. He can predict if a couple five years from now will be divorced by how he watches them fight for five minutes in his lab. He's been shown in multiple studies to be able to predict 90% of the time. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. You know what he looks for? The big secret, the big clinical secret that you pay big money to go on one of his workshops as a marriage therapist look for? Soft or harsh startup. If the couple begins, wham, like Thor, not good. It's a bad predictor. It's a bad predictor. If the couple begins making room and allowance and with some softness, much better predictor. Is it 100%? No, we all know tough couples that still are together. But it works better and it matches the scriptures. Be careful of your heart. Read the Gospels. Watch how Jesus acts closely. How does he speak to other people? Learn from the model of Scripture how the Master does it. I'll be doing this till the day I die because I'm still working on this. And if you think about if I honor Christ and my fellow man or woman when I speak the truth